Aloha Biochem. In this video, we continue in chapter two and discuss the electronic structure of the atom. So this time we are covering sections 2.5, 6, and 7. All of these and uh, then we'll do one more short video next time on the periodic trends. So electronic structure of the atom this time. Now let's recall the atomic structure that we discussed before. You remember atoms are composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And the protons and the neutrons are the heavy particles that occupy the tiny nucleus, but the electrons occupy a very large region surrounding the nucleus that we called the electron cloud. And we didn't really say much more about them uh, other than they're dispersed throughout the electron cloud. It turns out that the electrons are not just randomly dispersed throughout the electron cloud, that they have a certain arrangement that's very important. In fact, the electronic structure of the atom is really what chemistry is all about. You see, in chemistry and in biochemistry, we talk about substances that are made of molecules. And what are molecules? Molecules are what you have when two or more atoms attach together. Well, think about it. If you have two atoms and they attach or they get close together and start interacting with each other, it's their electron clouds that are interacting. And so if we can understand the behavior of electrons in the atom, then we can better understand how atoms form molecules and uh, take chemistry much, much further. As a simple example, let's look at a model of a hydrogen molecule. You remember hydrogen is element number one on the periodic table. It's, it's way up here at the very beginning, the first element. Its atomic number is one. So hydrogen atoms have one proton and one electron to balance it off. Okay, so the proton is in the nucleus and that electron is in the electron cloud somewhere. Now, hydrogen is one of those molecular elements. It comes in the form of two atom molecules. You very rarely see single atoms of hydrogen by themselves. And if you do, they're unstable and they're looking to latch on to another atom to form an H2 molecule. So several elements do this. They exist as molecules and hydrogen is one of them. Well, think about what happens when two hydrogen atoms come in contact and their electron clouds begin interacting. Uh, here is one hydrogen atom and it has an electron. And here is a, another hydrogen atom. There is its proton and, and it also has an electron. Well, what actually happens, the way the hydrogen molecule forms is these electrons, one from each atom, they interact to form a pair which is used to become the bond that connects the two atoms. You see, each atom will end up holding on to the same electron pair. And if you have this atom grabbing on to the same pair as the other atom, then those two atoms are linked. And that's what a hydrogen molecule is like. The, the two atoms are holding on to the same electron pair. Now there are several other molecular elements and they do very similar things. And, and we'll talk more about molecules in chapter four and, and how to draw molecules. So this is really a look ahead. In this chapter, we're just focusing on the atoms and the electron arrangement for different types of atoms. So the electronic structure. Now, we did discuss lithium atoms in a previous video. 
Let's recall that lithium is element number three on the periodic table. So let's uh, find lithium. It's right below hydrogen, it's element number three. So lithium atoms have three protons and the neutral atoms have uh, three electrons. And so the uh, protons are in the nucleus, there, there they are, and there are also some neutrons in there. But what about those three electrons? They are not just randomly dispersed throughout the electron cloud, they do have a certain arrangement. And that arrangement is what we're interested in this chapter. We want to know where are those electrons specifically. So the electrons do occupy certain regions of space around the nucleus, and these are called orbitals. They are not orbits. It's not like planets orbiting the sun. The orbitals are actually regions. So uh, the electrons exist in these orbitals. There are many orbitals that are around the nucleus and they come in all types of shapes and sizes. Um, so here are some of the orbital shapes that you'll find. Some of the orbitals that surround the nucleus are spherical. So if the nucleus is at the crosshairs right there, then an S orbital is a spherical orbital. Um, there, there is also uh, P type orbitals, which uh, surround the nucleus in a dumbbell type fashion. So if an electron is in a P orbital, it's either up here in this region or down there in this region. It's like two balloons back to back, but the electron is never right near the nucleus. It's either up on one side or down on the opposite side. Uh, D orbitals are more complicated type shapes. They're four balloons. And if an electron is in one of these orbitals, it's in one of these four regions. And F orbitals are even more complicated. Now I do have a, uh, a better representation of what these orbitals look like. It's, it's hard to draw these pictures. So if you imagine that the nucleus is at the very center, S orbitals are spherical regions around the nucleus and P orbitals are these dumbbell uh, type shapes. Now P orbitals, there are three different kinds. They all look exactly alike, but they're pointing in opposite directions. You have one pointing horizontally, one pointing vertically, and one going kind of into and out of the paper. P orbitals always come in sets of three. D orbitals are more complicated and they come in sets of five. Uh, most of them have four balloon type of regions. So this is a D orbital. That's another one that looks just like this, but it's pointing in a different direction. And here are a couple more that are pointing in different directions, but you got this one interesting looking one right there. And then F orbitals, they're the most complicated of the, of the four types of orbitals. And they're like eight balloons. And if an electron is in an F orbital, it's in one of these complicated looking regions. And, and there are many F orbitals. Now, an atom's nucleus is surrounded by many, many, many orbitals. There are multiple S type orbitals around the nucleus and there are uh, multiple sets of P orbitals and multiple sets of D orbitals and, and many F orbitals as well. So the nucleus is really surrounded by, you know, probably hundreds of different orbitals. It's very hard to draw a model of the atom showing all of those orbitals at the same time. But there is an interesting uh, video that I'll show you here in a moment that might help you understand uh, the orbitals a little bit better. But for now, uh, just know that the electrons occupy these orbitals. There are many orbitals around the nucleus and then they come in all shapes and sizes. Now further, the orbitals are kind of grouped into what are called shells. And the shells are a different proximity to the nucleus. So the orbitals that are closest to the nucleus are in the inner shells. And as orbitals get bigger and further away from the nucleus, they occupy 
shells that are farther away, so they're, they're grouped into a, maybe a, the second shell has orbitals that are larger and further away, and the third shell has orbitals that are even larger and further away than the second shell. Now just as a, a quick recap on the lithium atom, lithium is very simple. There are only three electrons. And uh, when you have just a few electrons, you only need uh, a couple of orbitals uh, for them to reside in. You see each orbital can fit two electrons. Now lithium has three electrons and the first two electrons are close to the nucleus in a S-type spherical orbital, and that third electron is a little bit further away in a larger spherical S-type orbital. And so you see lithium's three electrons uh, occupy two different shells. The, the two inner electrons are in the innermost shell. That inner shell has two electrons in its uh, a spherical orbital. And then that one single uh, third electron is in an outer shell. And we can write these things, and these are called electron configurations. Electron configurations are basically codes that tell us the orbitals occupied by the electrons. So there are two electrons in the innermost orbital, and there is one electron in the outermost orbital. So you see, you read electron configurations from left to right, and, and this goes from inner orbitals to outer orbitals, okay? Uh, so reading it from left to right, it's 1s2, 2s1, okay? 1s2, there are two electrons in this 1s orbital in the first shell. And then 2s1, there's one electron in that second shell inside of a 2s orbital. Now, the orbitals are grouped into shells, and it just turns out that uh, some shells have uh, just a few orbitals and other shells have many, many different types of orbitals. The innermost shells contain fewer orbitals than the outer shells. And the shell that's closest to the nucleus only has one orbital, in fact. This is the first shell. It's called shell number one, or n equals one. And shell number one is the closest one to the nucleus, and it only contains one of these spherical S-type orbitals. Okay, and so you can picture the nucleus right here at the crosshairs, and, and there is a region of space, a spherical region of space surrounding it, and that's the 1S orbital. And this has the capacity to fit two electrons. You know, each orbital can fit two electrons. So, uh, you know, further away from the nucleus in the second shell, there are several different orbitals. You know, the further you get away from the nucleus, uh, the more orbitals there are in those shells. And so the second shell has uh, also an S orbital, but it's slightly larger than the S orbital of the shell number one. So shell number two has a larger S orbital, you can see it in pink, but shell number two also has three P-type orbitals. Now I'll remind you that P-type orbitals look like this. There's a, a, a balloon or, you know, like a balloon region over here and a balloon region over there, and, and this is a single P orbital, but, P orbitals always come in sets of three and they all look alike. It's just they're pointing in different directions. So the second shell has three P orbitals. They're all pointing in different directions. And, and this is kind of like what the model of the second shell looks like. So there are four orbitals total in the second shell. The 2S orbital can fit two electrons and these two P orbitals each can hold two. So that's a total of six from the two p orbitals. So two plus six gives you eight electrons 
that can reside in the second shell. Now we can continue on. Uh, the further we get away from the nucleus, the larger the shells are and the more types and number of orbitals there are. So the third shell is even further away. It also has an s orbital and it also has uh, three of those p orbitals, but it it gains a new type of orbital. It has d orbitals as well. And d orbitals come in sets of five. So since this is the third shell, that s orbital is called a 3s. And the p orbitals are called 3ps. And those 5d orbitals are called 3ds. Now each one holds two electrons. So you have two can fit in this orbital and six can fit in those combined. And then 10 can fit in those combined. So the third shell can hold 18 electrons. And we'll stop at the fourth shell. Uh, you can go further, but the fourth shell gains a new type. Um, it has, in addition to the four S, the four P's, the four D's, you also have seven four F orbitals. And these are very complicated looking. And each of these orbitals holds uh, two electrons. And so the fourth shell can hold 32 electrons total. There are 16 orbitals total. That's 32 electrons can fit in the fourth shell. Now, just to maybe help you understand what the orbitals look like in a model, I have this simulation uh, that is on YouTube and it's very, uh, it's very interesting. It's the best one I've seen. So uh, imagine this is the, the nucleus of the atom and you're being shown where the orbitals are around the nucleus. Okay, now every single atom has lots and lots of orbitals, whether or not they're filled with electrons. Okay, every single atom has uh, many, many orbitals. So uh, this could be any atom that we're talking about here. Let's just play the video. So this is the innermost shell, which holds just one single orbital and that's an S orbital. The second shell has a slightly larger S-type orbital called the 2S. But there are also three of these 2P orbitals, and you can call them 2PX, uh, 2PY. And uh, 2PZ. You see the second shell's orbitals are larger and so if an electron is in one of those, it's further away from the nucleus. The third shell contains orbitals that are even larger than the second shell's orbitals. So the third shell has that 3s orbital. It has three of these 3p orbitals that are larger than the 2p orbitals of the second shell. p orbitals always come in sets of three. So there's the third one, 3pz. And I think, um, do we get to the fourth shell? Okay, yeah, the fourth shell, wow, uh, has a, a really large S-type orbital that encompasses the, you know, the first three shells, it ca encapsulates it. And the, the, the um, it turns out that the 4S orbital is slightly smaller than the 3D orbitals. So now you're being shown the rest of the third shell orbitals So shells kind of overlap. When you get to the third and fourth shell, it just so turns out that that 4s orbital is slightly smaller than these large 3d orbitals. So you see that the atom just has so many orbitals around it. And, and if we go into the 4p orbitals and the 4ds and the 4fs, this one didn't show that. But if we did that, you would you know, see many, many more. And then the fifth shell and sixth shell and seventh shell, hundreds of different types of orbitals surrounding the atom. So it's very hard to draw, but um, hopefully that simulation helped you understand. Uh, every nucleus is surrounded by all of these orbitals. But the good news is that uh, most of them are not really occupied because uh, in biochemistry, we're usually talking about 
small atoms with just a few electrons. So the atoms that we're interested in in this course, uh, there's just a few electrons. And so they're very easy to account for. Now, what I'd like to do now is to answer that question, where are the electrons? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the first several atoms on the periodic table. So here's that periodic table. We'll walk through several atoms up to uh, element number 11, uh, lithium. Okay, so starting with hydrogen, you know, we'll go through the first 11 elements and, and then answer that question as to where the electrons are. Now, one way to, to, to do this is to uh, write, write down uh, what's called the orbital energy diagram, or better yet, just find a good picture of it. So here's the picture that's in your textbook. This is, uh, I can't remember what figure number it is, but basically this orbital energy diagram lists all of the orbitals in order of how far they are from the nucleus. And that's the order with which they are filled when you have atoms that have lots of electrons. Okay, so what I like to, th the way I like to think of this diagram right here is kind of like a, a, a beaker. Okay, so let me, um, uh, you know, draw a beaker. So, so can you see this little, um, you know, rectangle that's kind of surrounding it? Um, and when you fill up an atom with electrons, it's kind of like filling up a beaker with water. The water goes down to the bottom because that's the most stable position for the water to be in, and then it fills from the bottom up. And likewise, when an atom has lots of electrons, the first electrons uh, will occupy the orbitals that are closest to the nucleus, that, you know, that first shell orbital, and then the second shell orbitals get occupied next, and then the third shell orbitals get occupied next. But, um, you know, the ordering is kind of interesting because the third and fourth shells kind of overlap so some of the third shell orbitals are occupied before that fourth shell orbital. And, and this orbital uh, energy diagram, uh, think of it like that. It's like a beaker. And, and when you fill an atom up with electrons, you just, you know, it's like you're dropping electrons into this beaker. So when we start with the first element, that's hydrogen. Let's find hydrogen on the periodic table. There, there it is. Hydrogen is element number one. It only has one electron. So going back to this, uh, you know, orbital energy diagram, this beaker, if we just have to drop one electron into the beaker, it goes all the way to the bottom. Okay. And it's going to go into this 1s orbital. And so that's where the electron is for hydrogen. Let's um, uh, let's show the model for hydrogen. So for the element hydrogen, its proton is of course at the nucleus, and that one single electron occupies that one s orbital. And you remember the s orbitals are spherical orbitals uh, around the nucleus, and the one s orbital is is really close to the nucleus because it's in the first shell. So here's the model of the hydrogen atom. You have the proton and the electron is pretty close to it in the first shell, in that 1s orbital inside the first shell. Now along with the model, we can write what's called the orbital diagram. And that's basically um, taking uh, this picture and listing the boxes next to each other that are being occupied. So we only have an electron in this 1s box and so the orbital diagram um, looks like this. You have the 1s box with only one electron, and the electron is represented as an arrow because they have like a spin. Okay, so this electron's spinning that way. 
Now, along with the orbital diagram, we can write the electron configuration, which is simply a, a shorter way of representing this. So uh, that 1s orbital, there is a picture of it, that 1s orbital has one electron in there. Okay, so that's the electron configuration for hydrogen. It's a uh, very simple. The 1s orbital has one electron in there, and so we read this as 1s1. Now, for elements and atoms, we, after we write the electron configuration, we often ask the question, how many valence electrons are there? How many outer electrons are there? Um, hydrogen only has one electron, and so it is the outermost electron. And so for hydrogen, there is only one valence electron, one outermost electron. Some atoms with lots of electrons, uh, you know, most of them are closer to the nucleus. Those are the inner electrons, and there are only a few valence electrons. And so for the, as we work our way to larger and larger atoms, we'll have to deal with that. But hydrogen is very simple. It's one and only electron is the outermost electron. And, and so we write the corresponding Lewis dot structure. Hydrogen has one dot to represent its outermost electron. Okay, so there is the Lewis structure for hydrogen. These Lewis dot structures will be important as we get into chapter four when we start drawing molecules. And you'll see that hydrogen with its one dot likes to attach to one other atom. Now let's, let's go down to element number two, helium. So helium is um, uh, let's find that on the periodic table. That's, uh, you know, you have hydrogen up here and then uh, helium is across. Element number two. Okay, th there, there it is. All right. So helium has two electrons. And uh, before we work our way through this, let's just go back to that orbital energy diagram. Um, so... Get rid of that. There, uh, no, not that. There it is. So you remember the orbital energy diagram uh, describes all of the orbitals around the atom, around the nucleus. And as you drop in two electrons, they go down to the bottom first and they start occupying the innermost orbitals. Uh, and then when the innermost orbitals fill up, you start working your way up. But each orbital holds two electrons. So that's uh, helium has two electrons and they can both fit in the 1s orbital. All right. And so for helium, uh, just like we can draw the model for hydrogen, here's helium's model. Uh, helium has two protons and it has two neutrons, but uh, those two electrons are also in the 1s orbital. And the orbital diagram for helium is that 1s box, but now it has two electrons. And anytime you have two electrons inside the same orbital, they're spinning in opposite directions, and that's why the arrows are pointing in opposite directions. So the orbital diagram uh, is a little more complicated than hydrogens. You just have another electron in there. And then the electron configuration is pretty easy to write. That 1s orbital now has two electrons okay now looking at helium um, these two electrons they are both valence electrons they are both outer electrons one of these electrons isn't further away from the nucleus than the other one is because they're both in the first shell they're both about the same distance away so we say that helium has two valence electrons and so the Lewis dot structure for helium is HE with two dots. HE with two dots and, and these electrons are kind of paired up right there. So helium uh, isn't going to bond 
to any other atoms. <clears throat> okay, let's go down to element number three, lithium. Uh, lithium is right here below hydrogen, and you'll find lithium right there. This is the third element, so we're talking about three electrons now. And here's the the um, orbital diagram. So now we have three electrons to drop into this beaker. So the first two will go into the 1s orbital and, and, and now that is filled up to capacity. So that third electron has to go here. You see the blue arrows tell you which one you start filling up next. So after this is filled, then the third one goes there into that 2s orbital. So the third electron starts filling up the second shell's orbitals. Okay, and you remember the 2s orbital is, is just a larger s orbital. It looks just like the 1s orbital, but it encapsulates it. It's a larger spherical region. And so lithium with three protons in the nucleus, uh, those three electrons, two of them are in the inner 1s orbital, and then the third one occupies that outer 2s orbital. And so uh, the orbital diagram, you know, you take those uh, boxes that were filled up, two of them go in here, and then the third one goes in there, and, and then you can uh, write the orbital diagram like this. Orbital diagrams are written horizontally. So two of them occupy the 1s orbital, and the third one goes in the 2s orbital, and we can translate this into the electron configuration, 1s2. So two of them are in the 1s orbital, and then 2s1. One of them is in the 2s orbital. Now you can see I've highlighted this one in green because this orbital is the valence, is in the valence shell. So now you have an, an electron in the second shell, and it's further away from the nucleus than those two inner shell electrons, those two one, you know, first shell electrons. So there is a single electron that's further away, and that's the valence electron. So here, lithium has one valence electron, and we give lithium a single dot. All right. Now, it's no coincidence that lithium has one valence electron just like hydrogen does. Lithium is in the same column as hydrogen. So when you look at the periodic table, let me show you a periodic table kind of blown up a little bit. You see, you will find that as you do these, uh, as you do work your way throughout the periodic table, every element that's in group 1a has a single valence electron. So we just saw that hydrogen does and lithium does, but uh, you'll see in a moment when we get to sodium, it also has a single valence electron. And then when you get to these elements in group 2a, they will have two valence electrons. And that's where the, this, this uh, group numbering scheme using the a's and b's helps out. Elements in this column have one valence electron. Elements in this column have two. And then skipping over those, you know, the elements in group 3a, there are three valence electrons. These have four, those have five, those have six, seven, and eight. All right, so keep that in mind. Let's, let's continue on. After lithium, we get to beryllium. So beryllium um, is, is element number four. He, here it is next to, to lithium. You know, lithium is number three. Uh, beryllium is, is number four. So now we have four electrons. Okay, in a moment I'm going to show you an easier way to do electron configurations. But for now, let's continue with the beaker method. So let's go back to our orbital diagram. And, and, and here's uh, the orbitals that you're filling up. Okay, so this is the beaker method. This is the hard way to do it. Okay, you have to have this picture to help you out. Um, so now we have four electrons to drop into the beaker. Well, the first two 
will go into the 1s orbital and they'll fill that up. And then the next two will fill up the 2s orbital. Okay, so not so hard. Um, so for beryllium, um, you see those first two electrons fill up the 1s orbital. That's that small spherical orbital. And then the next two electrons fill up the uh, the second shell's s orbital, that 2s orbital. And so the orbital diagram would be 1s is filled up and then 2s is filled up. And this translates into the electron configuration, uh, 1s2 for those two, and then 2s2 for those two. Now these 2s electrons, that one and that one, are further away from the nucleus than those. So you see there are two valence electrons. And so beryllium uh, has two, uh, you know, two valence electrons. And this is its Lewis dot structure. You have a dot over here and a dot over there. Now, for helium, we put the dots right next to each other. And for beryllium, we separate the dots. And, and this is to just acknowledge that beryllium isn't done, done filling up its second shell. You still have the, the 2p orbitals to fill up. And so we're going to separate the dots. All right, later on, and in chapter four, we'll see that beryllium is able to connect to two other atoms. It can form two bonds. Okay. Now, uh, atom number five is boron. So let's find boron. You'll see it's after beryllium. Um, so here's the periodic table. So once you get to uh, beryllium, you, you skip on over and there is boron element number five. See that element number five and then comes carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. Those three very important ones that you need to know about. But boron's number five. We have five electrons. And um, going back to the beaker. Okay, so we've put the first four, we have to drop in five now, but the first four fill up the 1s orbital and the 2s orbital, and that fifth electron will need to go in one of these, 2p orbitals. Remember, 2p orbitals, there are three of them that look just like one another. They're the dumbbell-shaped ones, you know, uh, but they're pointing in different directions. One vertical, one horizontal, one going into and out of the paper, and... And so it doesn't matter which one that fifth electron goes into, it just goes into one of them. And, and so uh, for boron, yeah, you can draw the model like this, that 1s orbital that's innermost has two electrons in there. Uh, the, the 2s orbital, a larger sphere, has, is filled up too with two electrons. And then one of those 2p orbitals has an electron in there. So maybe it's that one. Okay, with, with an electron in there. All right. So uh, boron has five protons, and then the five electrons, those are the orbitals that they're occupying. And you can see this time that uh, two electrons are in uh, the inner shell, and then these three electrons are in the second shell. So we can take this orbital diagram and write the electron configuration, those two inner shell 1s electrons would be 1s2. And then the outer shell, the second shell, has the 2s's and the 2p's. Uh, so the 2s is filled up, 2s2. And then the 2p's can hold the total of six. You know, they kind of are grouped together in the orbital diagram. They hold a total of six, but we only have one of them because this is element number five. We only needed to add one into the 2p's. And so we say 2p1. Now, the second shell combined has a total of three electrons, two of them in the 2s orbital and one of them in the 2p orbital. And so we say there are three valence electrons. You know, the three electrons, these three are further away from the nucleus than those. So these are the three valence electrons. And so for boron, we surround it with three dots, one, two, three. And boron can connect to three atoms, as we'll see in chapter four. Now we get to the um, uh, the best one, carbon. Carbon's very interesting. 
carbon is element number six. It's right next to boron. And so uh, we can go back to the orbital diagram and, and drop electrons into the beaker, but I wanna show you an easier way to do it now. So let me, um, let me show you an easier way. Okay, so here's the orbital diagram. If you look at figure 2.9 in your textbook, you'll, you'll see this uh, periodic table that looks like that. None of the element symbols are in there. It just kind of uh, uh, has this 1s, 2s, you know, 2p, 3p. And this table um, is designed to help you write electron configurations. Um, so over here is the S block. Um, uh, over here is the P block. This is the D block and that's the F block. And, and the way that you uh, interpret that is if you have one of these elements that, that are in the S block, then the last electron will go into an S orbital. And further, uh, the S block is divided into 1S, 2S, 3S, 4S. So if you have an element, say, right here, then the final electron will be going into a 2S orbital. And, and if you have an element over here in the P block, maybe it's in the 3P section, then the final electron will be going into a 3P orbital. So I think we're doing a carbon now. Carbon is right there. Let's just uh, make sure the carbon's right there. So let's go, um, you know, here we're talking about the, the second one. Okay, the second one in the P block, the first row of the P block. So let's find that, just make sure that's carbon. So here's the P block, you know, the first row of the P block and the second element is carbon. Okay, carbon is element number six. Um, and so the way you use this periodic table, this one right here, to get the electron configuration of carbon is you just work your way from the beginning, right there at the beginning, and then you work your way to carbon. Okay, so working our way to carbon, we go through the first row, that's the 1s row. So this is 1s1, 1s2, we, we fill up the 1s orbitals, so 1s2, and then we go through the second row. 2s, we, we, we fill up the 2s's, 2s2, you know, the s orbitals hold the capacity of two, the p orbitals hold the capacity of six because there are three of them. But carbon uh, is only the second element in the 2p section, so you don't have to add all six electrons to fill up the 2p orbital, it's just two of them, 2p2. Okay, so again, 1s2, we go through the first row, 2s2, we're not done yet, and then we end up in the 2p's, 2p2. So that's 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And let's just uh, write that down. So, so carbon, is, is a 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Now, if you had done the beaker method, you would have gotten the same answer. You see, going back to the beaker, um, you have six electrons. Two go there, two go there, and then two of them will go in here. This holds a total of six, but you only need two of them. One, two. They'll occupy separate P orbitals because they like to be away from each other. You know, electrons are negatively charged. You want to be away from each other. So one of them will go in one and one of them will go in the other, but they're both in 2p orbitals. So either method works, but trust me, the periodic table will, will be better. You'll be better off using this. And then, uh, so here's the, the model. You have two electrons in the, in the first shell, in that 1s orbital of the first shell. And the rest of the electrons will end up in the second shell. Two of them go into the 2s orbital and the other two go into the 2p orbitals. So one in this one and then one in that one. And you can write the electron configuration. 1s2 
and then 2s2, uh, 2p2. So the second shell, that outermost shell, the valence shell, has a total of four electrons. So there are four valence electrons, right? And so carbon gets four dots. All right, one, two, three, four. And carbon is able to form four bonds. It can connect to a maximum of four other atoms. That's the most, that's the best that uh, you'll be dealing with, okay? Now, when you get to nitrogen, you'll see that um, uh, it, it cannot form as many bonds. Let's do nitrogen. And let's use the periodic table method. So nitrogen is next to carbon. It's, um, you know, uh, carbon's number six, uh, nitrogen's number seven. Okay, nitrogen's number seven. And... Um, you know, the beaker method, uh, you would, uh, you know, two, four, um, five, six, seven. So, you know, five, six, seven. And then, uh, so the last three electrons are gonna be in 2p orbitals. So you have 1s2, 2s2, and then 2p has three, that fifth, sixth, and seventh one. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, and then that's what we'll get using the periodic table as well. So nitrogen was right there, the third element in the 2p section. Okay, so you, you, to get to nitrogen, you 1s2, down to the second row, 2s2, and then 2p, 1, 2, 3, 2p3. All right, and then you'll, uh, you'll see nitrogen's... Um, you know, model, the, the 1s is filled up with those two electrons. The 2s is filled up. That larger sphere has got two electrons in there. And then the two p's, one, two, three, one goes in this one, one goes in that one, and one goes into the other one, into and out of the paper. All right, so notice that this time there are five valence electrons. You have these two inner shell electrons and then those five outer shell electrons. So the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And so count them all up, there's five of them. So nitrogen gets five dots. One, two, three, four, go back and pair it, five. Okay, uh, that's how you do the electron dot structures. And you go around and then you have to go back and pair it once you get back to the fourth one. So one, two, three, four, go back and pair it, five. So these two are paired and now there, there are only three unpaired electrons. So nitrogen can only connect to three other atoms, kind of like uh, boron. You know, so carbon was the most. Um, you know, oxygen, it will only be able to form two bonds. Okay, um, now I'll remind you though, uh, nitrogen has five valence electrons and you can quickly get that um, information from the periodic table because nitrogen is in column 5A, right? If you use that group numbering scheme, the A's and the B's, nitrogen is in group 5A, so it has five valence electrons. All of these have five valence electrons. Phosphorus will too. If you, uh, if you do phosphorus as electron configuration, you'll see that. Carbon was in group 4A. It had four valence electrons, all right? 4A, all of these elements have four. Carbon, silicon, you know, boron is in group 3A. It has three valence electrons. All right, and, um, so you can see uh, nitrogen has five, uh, carbon you know, had four, and then boron had three. You get that information from the group number as well. So uh, get to know your periodic table. Now when you get to oxygen, that's right next to nitrogen. Oxygen is element number eight. So now we have eight electrons to add. And just using the periodic table, Okay, oxygen would be right there. 
So working our way to oxygen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Okay. So here's oxygen's model. Now we have six electrons in the second shell, you know, two electrons in the inner first shell and then six in the second shell. So we're working our way towards filling up these 2p orbitals. We're not there yet. Uh, you know, uh, they have a capacity of six and oxygen has put four of them in there. So, um, you know, including those two plus these four, there are six total valence electrons. And so oxygen gets uh, six dots for its, for its Lewis dot structure. One, two, three, four, go back and pair it, five, and then six. It, it doesn't matter which sides are paired. I just decided on the top and the bottom. So uh, one, two, three, four, now we pair them, five, and then six. You see, now you have two unpaired electrons and oxygen can connect to two other atoms. Like in water, H2O. Um, fluorine, fluorine is um, element number nine. And you see, you can kind of just continue oxygen. Here's oxygen's orbital diagram. Well, fluorine's gonna get one more. And fluorine's gonna get one more. And if oxygen was 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, Fluorine will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. And it gets one more. So there are seven valence electrons. And you get that uh, from the periodic table too because um, uh, fluorine you know, is in group number uh, seven right there. All of these in, in, in the halogen column, these are the halogens. They all have seven valence electrons. And, um, you know, their, their, their dot structures all look similar. So fluorine's dot structure, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So only one unpaired electron and fluorine only likes to bond to one other atom. Now, when you get to um, uh, neon, uh, something interesting happens. Uh, you know, the second shell is filled up. So uh, fluor fluorine is, is right here. And then neon is the end of the second row or the second period. And, and you'll see that that just means that the second shell is, is now filled up. So if this was fluorine, uh, just add one more electron to it. Now the the p orbitals, the two p orbitals are are completely filled up. You see, fluorine had one remaining spot, but neon is element number ten. So two electrons go in the first shell, and then the second shell has the two s and the two p's. And so now everything's filled up in the second shell, and the electron configuration is one s two, two s two, two p six. You can get that from the periodic table as well. So here's neon right there. So, so 1s2, second row, 2s2, and then 2p, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2p6. That's where you end up. Okay, now you can just read any element, any atom's electron configuration right off this table. So we'll do one more. Um, sodium is right there. And uh, so, oh, by the way, neon has eight valence electrons, eight valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they're all paired up. Neon doesn't like to form any bonds. You won't see neon atoms attaching to any other atom. It, it doesn't do that. It's an unreactive element. In fact, all of the, um, all of the noble gases are uh, unreactive. So these guys over here, these are the noble gases. They don't like to attach to other atoms. So these atoms like to just sit by themselves for the most part. You know, it's very hard for them to attach to any other atom. Uh, the halogens are all similar. Remember, 
elements in the same column are similar. And hopefully you're starting to see some of that now from the electronic structure of their atoms. Okay, so we got one more. Let's do sodium, which is element number 11. Uh, we got 11 electrons now. And um, uh, maybe we'll, you know, we could go forward. We could do potassium as well. But um, so sodium is element number 11. Now, now going back to the periodic table, one second. I'm going back there. I bet you anything that sodium will have one valence electron because it's in group 1A. They all do. So does potassium. Let's just check it. So, uh, so sodium goes right there. Its last electron is going to be a 3s electron. I guarantee it. You know, even if you look, even if you do it using the old beaker method. So two, four, six, eight, ten. 11, right? You see, the 11th one would go there. And, and the, from the periodic table, you just get to sodium. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, you go all the way through this, and then 3s1. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. And so that's... Uh, you know, the model right there. So that last electron opens up the third shell and it's further away from the nucleus than those other inner 10 electrons, which are in the first and second shell. So that third shell electron, which is in the 3s orbital, um, is the single valence electron. Now here, you can write the whole electron configuration by including all of the orbitals that were occupied. So the 1s2, the the, the the 2s2, and then the, the 2p orbitals hold 6, so 2p6, and then 3s1. But there's a shorter way to do it. If you want to, um, you can just say, well, look at this part. This is the same as neons. That's the same as neons. So instead of writing it all out, I'm just going to say it. we'll start at neon. That's neons, and then 3s1. And so you can do that for electron configurations. You can just... Uh, say what the previous noble gas was. So, so going to the periodic table, this is sodium right here. If you want to know what its electron configuration is, well, um, the previous noble gas is, is uh, element number 10. It's, it's neon at the end of the second row. So it's neon, and then continuing on for neon, this is the 3s section. Remember, that's the 3s section. So neon... 3s1. And if you do uh, potassium right below it, potassium is right below it. There's um, uh, so sodium, there's potassium. You want to know potassium's electron configuration? It would be argon. Argon's at the end of the third row. That's the previous noble gas. Argon and then 4s1. This is in the 4s section. Argon 4s1. All right, uh, see potassium's right there. Argon at the end of the third row and then 4s1. Okay. So do several more examples. You know, sometimes it gets tricky when you have to go way down here. The electron configurations can get kind of long and you know, it's interesting when you have to do an element inside here. But in, in biochemistry, what are the four elements we're talking about again? Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. We're, we're, we're dealing with smaller atoms in biochemistry. So I think if you, if you understood how to do the smaller atoms, you know, you're, you got it 96% of the way, okay? So uh, that's how you do it. Um, what else? I think we're, you know, uh, roughly there. And um, so we, we worked our way up to uh, you know, sodium. And, and here I just threw in a few more um, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and bromine. Silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and bromine. I a few th th threw a few more into the notes. So if you want to do phosphorus, for example, phosphorus, let's find phosphorus on the periodic table. Um, 
phosphorus is going to be right below nitrogen. So here's nitrogen, there's phosphorus. So let's find it just to make sure. Okay, there's nitrogen, there's phosphorus. See, phosphorus is also going to be similar to nitrogen because it's in the same column. Nitrogen had five valence electrons, and phosphorus is also going to have five. Okay? But they'll be in, in the third shell, those five valence electrons. This is the third period. They'll be in the third shell. So when you use the periodic table to get to phosphorus, you know, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. 3s2, 3p3 gets you to phosphorus. And so... Um, you know, it's 3s2, 3p3. Remember, we don't have to write all the previous stuff. We can just start at the previous noble gas. It would be neon and then 3s2, 3p3. And, and so those five valence electrons gives phosphorus five dots, just like nitrogen. Phosphorus and nitrogen are very similar in how they behave, you know. Very similar chemical properties. If you want to do a really big one, let's let's end up with, uh, say, bromine. Let's let's do the, you know, the largest one here. Um, bromine. There you go. So, bromine. Where's that? It's way down there. That's that liquid element. So this is element 35. So you got 35 electrons to throw in to that beaker. So you, you probably don't want to do the beaker method. You know, do the periodic table method. Do the periodic table. So to get to bromine, you know, to do it the long way, well, you have to go through, you know, three rows and you end up almost at the end of the fourth row. And, and so that would take a little while, but let's, let's do it. So bromine is right there, almost at the end of the fourth row. It's right below chlorine and fluorine. So there's bromine. And so to get there, the last electron is going to go into the 4P we're going to end up with 4p5. But let's get there. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Got to get to bromine. And then 4s2. Now you go down to 3d. You, you know, it turns out the 4s's are filled before the 3d. So this is 4s2, 3d, 10. There's 10 spots. And then back up to 4, 4p5. Okay. And you could also start from the previous noble gas, argon, 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. And that's the way I have it written here. It's argon, 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. I forgot that 3d10. So I, your instructor made a typo here. 4 argon and then 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. Okay, Dag, nab it. Um, so let's just splice in a 3D10 right there. Okay, imagine it's there. You got good imagination. So there's a 3D10 in here. But even if it was there, it's not written, the highest shell number is 4. And shell number 4 has two electrons in the 4s orbital and then five electrons in the 4p orbital. Two plus five is seven. And so bromine has seven valence electrons. It gets seven dots, just like chlorine above it. Oh yeah, that was a mistake. Um, it should have the 3d10 in there, but still, uh, those 10 electrons in the 3d orbitals don't give you 10 more valence electrons because it's in the third shell. Anyway, a little confusing point. Um, now, to finish up this, uh, uh, this, let's see, to finish up this um, lecture, let me move this out of, uh, out of the way. Let's put that over there. And I'd, I want to show you what we're going to use these dot structures for. So this is a, a look ahead. We use these dot structures, you know, there's hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. I would memorize those. Hydrogen has one valence electron. It gets one dot. 
carbon has four, it gets four dots, nitrogen has five, and oxygen has six. We use these dot structures to draw molecules. So if you want to know how the atoms are connected in water molecules, for instance, H2O, you have two hydrogen atoms, there they are, you draw the dot structures, and then one oxygen atom, there it is. And then you connect these atoms together in the way that uh, we can predict. Oxygen wants to connect to two atoms, and hydrogen only wants to connect to one. So to make everybody happy, you kind of move these atoms around and, and, and position them like that. And you see oxygen, uh, this electron is going to attach to hydrogen, and this hydrogen's electron is going to attach to oxygen. And, and so they form a bond. And you replace those two dots with a line. And so this hydrogen is holding on to that pair of electrons, and this oxygen is also holding on to that pair. And so these two atoms are connected now. And and the oxygen can also connect uh, with its other single electron to the other hydrogen atom. So this is how the atoms are connected in water. It's H-O-H. -H. It's definitely not H-H-O. You, you cannot have H-H-O because hydrogen cannot be in the middle. Hydrogen can only form one bond. You know, oxygen can form two bonds, right? So oxygen has to be in the middle, and hopefully the dot structures help you see that. One more example, a methane molecule, CH4. Methane, this is an organic gas, um, CH4. Here's a carbon atom with four dots. Remember, carbon uh, has uh, four valence electrons with four dots, and hydrogen has one valence electron with one dot. So if you want to draw the model for methane, you just simply... Uh, list all of the atoms out. There are their dot structures, and then you move the atoms around. Carbon wants to connect to four atoms, and hydrogen only wants to connect to one. Well, that's perfect because, uh, you know, each hydrogen can connect to the carbon simultaneously. And so what you end up with is, you know, the atoms positioned like that, and now you replace the two dots with bonds, and, and you see that a molecule of methane has carbon in the middle and it's surrounded by the four hydrogens. Okay, that's what a molecule of methane looks like. Uh, it's a carbon connected simultaneously to all four hydrogen atoms around it. Now we'll do a lot more of these Lewis structures in Lewis 4, but that's just a look ahead, all right? Um, chapter 4, Drawing Molecules. So this is kind of a long lecture. I hope you were able to hang in there. Um, our next one will be shorter to make up for the last lecture of chapter two. And um, I hope you learned something, but definitely go back over this video. If it didn't quite click, hopefully it will the second time around. And I will see you next time. Aloha.